Hi, and thank you for tuning in to Noir Histoire. I'm Natasha, and in this episode, I'll be discussing The Revisioners by Margaret Wilkerson Sexton. The Revisioners by Margaret Wilkerson Sexton tells the story of two black women dealing with racial tension during different time periods. Josephine's story jumps back and forth between her enslavement as a child and being a free woman with grown children in the post-Civil War years. As an adult, Josephine married a man with whom she was able to acquire some property and achieve financial independence, though it later sparks jealousy in white neighbors who were less fortunate. Ava is a biracial woman raising her son as a single mother in present-day New Orleans. She's experienced some setbacks, and in hopes of improving her financial situation to offer her son a better life, Ava agrees to move in with her white grandmother. While loving at times, her grandmother is the study of microaggressions and has episodes that hint at the prejudice view she held and could more openly express in her younger years. I believe this is the second book that I've read by this author, the previous one being The Vanishing Half. Ava is in her 30s, has a son, and pretty much she's had some setbacks in life that's resulted in her kind of needing an opportunity to hit reset, to get her financial situation in order, to get a more secure footing with her housing to bring stability to her life, hoping that she can then offer her son more. And the way that this comes about, or her goal, her means for bringing this about, is that she has her grandmother, who is an older woman, and at this point is kind of experiencing some dementia, it seems like Alzheimer's, something along those lines. And having been widowed, now living on her own, she could use a bit of help and assistance. There's a nurse that comes out to take care of her, but she can use a little bit more help, right? More importantly, Certainly she needs care, but she really needs a bit of companionship. She wants someone to keep her company. Ava takes advantage of this. It allows her an opportunity to kind of hopefully strengthen, build her relationship with her grandmother, while at the same time living with her grandmother and being paid for it should hopefully allow her to save money rather than spending it on rent and other household expenses. And so it's like her grandmother isn't rich, but financially comfortable. Now, on the other hand, you then have Josephine, where she's like, her story is then further split into two. Her as a child, her as an adult woman, middle-aged woman. She has children, a few daughters, at least one son, but she has a grandson that she really loves. And so it's like, by the time we meet her as an adult in the book, she's a very good cook. She has a number of skills, um, which include helping women give birth, knowing about different herbs, potions, home remedies that can be used to care for people who are sick. And so within this community, she's very valuable. In addition to that, she was married, but unfortunately, by the time the story picks up, her husband has passed away, and so she's widowed. But the opportunity presents itself had presented itself for her and her husband to purchase some property. And over the years, um, they purchased more property. And now they're living like on a pretty decent parcel of land, which she now works with her son or rather manages with her son. They have a farm, they grow various crops and whatnot. They're doing quite well for themselves, especially to be black people living just shortly after the end of the civil war. It turns out that these two women are related to each other, like they're distant relatives. The thing that ties them together, Josephine, I believe, is like Ava's great-great-grandmother, right? Ava decides to move in with her grandmother. On the surface, this shouldn't be an issue, but the situation is a little bit complicated in the sense that on two fronts, first off, her grandmother is getting older and has some kind of health issue that's causing her to be forgetful and at times somewhat aggressive. And so it's described as most likely being dementia, but isn't exactly called that, right? I'm not an authority on the situation, on the subject, you know. Um, I know that people who have dementia, they can be confused. They can sometimes be combative. And so this is like one thing she's having to deal with. At times, her grandmother can be perfectly lucid, loving, right? Very well aware of what's going on. And without any notice, she's forgotten where she is. She forgets details about things. She wanders off at times. In addition to this, so it's like an example of this is at one point in the book, she gives Ava a piece of jewelry. It's given to her as a gift. And because of her dementia, her forgetfulness, she later um, sees it and forgets that she gave it to it to Ava, assuming first assumption is that Ava had stolen it, which leads to all of these 
like accusations, you know, and it's like complicating this is that Ava's mother is actually a black woman. Her father was a white man. And so it's like, at this point, there are like two generations apart, but those years span quite a bit of social change. You have some racial tension between like the members of the family where her grandmother had been loving, sweet, tender, nice towards Ava as a kid. But as now, like her dementia comes into play and she can completely flip, right? Not to excuse the grandmother's behavior, but her grandmother grew up in a different time where social practices, what was and was not acceptable was different. Things have changed over the years. And so her grandmother came from what sounds like a pretty well-to-do family. She grew up referring to black people as colored, having very stereotypical views about black people, just a host of problematic beliefs and behaviors that she held. And as part of that is, you know, she has the social circle, people that she's known for decades at this point, older women around her age. It's not really delved into any detail, right? But we can assume with these being her friends and they're all about the same age. They've come from similar backgrounds and you get the sense that they probably hold some of those views as well. And so there's kind of this ongoing thing about racial insensitivity, microaggressions, where they say things that aren't socially acceptable anymore, or rather they hold some of the same views of the past, but given how things have changed, they make an attempt to put a sheen or gloss on them. They're not necessarily not racist, but they realize that being racist is frowned upon. So it's like they still hold on to these prejudiced views, these racist views, but they try to hide them, right? Or they attempt to make them more palatable, more acceptable. And so over the course of the story where um, Ava and her son are now living with the grandma, you know, from the outset, her son isn't really comfortable with moving into what would be his great grandmother's house. The grandma helped to take care of Ava's son when he was younger as Ava and her um, then husband, right, they were married. But by the time the story picks up, they're now divorced, or at least they've broken up right? Whatever form that relationship was, was no longer. But her grandmother had helped her out a bit with childcare when her son was a baby. But it seems like in the years since there's probably been, he's aware of who she is, but he spent less time with his great grandmother than he has with his grandmother. And as a result of that, moving into this house, part of it is that they're also leaving behind this community where he spent at least the last few years of his life. He has a circle of friends. You know, this is the community in which he'd grown up. So there was some degree of comfort and familiarity, but now moving into his great grandmother's house, it sort of uprooted him from this environment that he'd grown used to, the friends that he's had. And so with that, there's now like this stress and tension from her son. He explains that He has a bad feeling about moving into the house. Nothing like concrete, right? Now, to be clear, this isn't like a ghost story or anything like that. There's no like, you know, goblin hiding in the attic. It's not that kind of story, but just rather that in moving into this house with his great grandmother, with whom he doesn't have like the closest relationship, with them being somewhat unfamiliar with each other, there's some discomfort in having to now live in such what's going to be close quarters with her. He feels apprehensive about moving into the house and expresses his concerns to his mom. Now, granted, with her great grandmother coming from, with her grandmother coming from a rather well-to-do family, seeming to have married someone that, you know, led a successful life, the house they're living in now is not a mansion, but it's described as being a pretty nice house. They have some luxuries that Ava and her son aren't quite used to. Part of him moving is that he now has to change schools. So he'd been going to a local school in their old neighborhood, but now moving to his great grandmother's house where he's going to be going to school, right? He's going to go to a school local to the house with his grandmother living in a more well-to-do part of town. The school has more resources than the one he previously attended. You know, the demographics of his grandma, of his great grandmother's house are different, which is that he's now living in this predominantly white neighborhood and not just predominantly white, but predominantly white and seemingly well-to-do in that the kids he goes to school with are also predominantly white and the families they come from are 
at least financially stable, if not comfortable or wealthy. And so it's like he goes off to school and the upside is that he's able to make friends. He's welcomed in. I found myself kind of holding my breath, watching his son kind of get his bearings out of fear that with him being a more obviously black boy. So Ava's mother is black, but her father is white. She's described as having a light complexion and being, if not racially ambiguous, then certainly light skinned. So it's like, you know, people might have to do a double take to kind of figure out what her racial or ethnic background might be. But with her son, because his dad was a dark skinned black man, he's not at all racially ambiguous. And so she's apprehensive when he starts off at this new school that he wouldn't be welcomed. If he wasn't like outright shunned, then the students, if not their parents, might make him feel uncomfortable. So fortunately that doesn't happen. He ends up befriending a few girls at school who take a liking to him. Their parents do as well, or at least like the moms, the dads don't really factor into the story. And so there's the positivity of him, despite being in this new environment, and having left his friends behind that at least he's welcomed in and he isn't ostracized. He doesn't feel left out or anything like that. So that's certainly a positive. And it allows Ava to kind of rest easy with some of the concerns that she had of things that might go wrong. But as the book continues with the two of them now basically being transplanted into this new environment where the people that surround them are very different from themselves, at least with regards to race, if not their economic backgrounds, there's not so much of a culture shock as much as over the course of the story, you bear witness to them experiencing what could be described as microaggressions, where either through ignorance or insensitivity, unkind things are said to them, assumptions are made, things along those lines. So for the most part, Ava's grandmother is with it. But like she slips up every now and then at one point, forgetting who Ava's son is, refers to him as like the colored boy. She accuses them of like stealing her jewelry, which she'd actually given to Ava. And it's also explained that when Ava was a kid growing up, like her grandmother was actually quite kind to her, treated her very well, but her grandmother wasn't very nice to her mother. Like she would go over and spend time at her grandmother's house and her race didn't seem to be an issue at the time. But now that her grandmother is older, she's dealing with dementia, she's forgetful. She says insensitive things at times. You get the sense that she's not purposefully trying to be mean, but that with her dementia, it causes her, it complicates things. There are things that if she didn't have dementia, that she probably had the presence of mind not to say. But with the dementia, it's like, in a sense, it gives you a deeper peek into some of the um, perspectives that you might have held in the past, but learn to hide over time. Because over the course of the story and later in the book, when we, you know, when we see her mother, where unfortunately her mom is dealing with some health, Ava's mom is dealing with some health issues, right? She used to be like a lawyer and decided to shutter her practice in favor of becoming um, a doula. You know, where now she works in the community, surrounds herself with different kinds of people and is doing work within the community, helping women, especially young women who might not have a solid support system or might have other needs and concerns and things like that, helping them prepare for childbirth. This experience of connecting with these young women and helping them prepare for childbirth, it gives her a great deal of fulfillment, more so like we don't get much in-depth detail or character analysis about her mom, but you get the sense that it's implied rather that in making this career change that she now feels more fulfilled in this line of work. She begins to, um, she says she was like trying to figure things out, what her next steps would be. And she encourages Ava to possibly consider going into being a doula as well, because it's something she thinks she'd be good at, something that she might find fulfilling. So when her mother becomes, when Ava's mother becomes ill, it provides an opportunity for her to kind of step in, fill in for her mom and provide support to these women. As part of that, it gives her a more up close look into the job of being a doula and what that entails. And then also part of that, the feeling, the sense of fulfillment that you could possibly get from that line of work. And that actually ties back to their ancestor, Josephine, who the story kind of jumps over that at a point in her life, she was a doula, right? And it focuses on the period when like she was a child growing up enslaved. 
Later on, she's been a doula for several years. And so it's like, you get a peek into Josephine's relationship with her mother, you know, who had been a doula and for lack of a better term, a medicine woman, you know, you all, you get to see their relationship. You get to see some insight into day-to-day life on a plantation, the things that go along with that. But then you also get a peek into her relationship with her mom, you know, this mother daughter relationship, this sweet relationship that she has as well with her father. And as part of that, it branches out wider beyond that to some of the other people on the plantation and some of the other like goings on in the plantation with her being put in, in place, which is, you know, a common practice of her being, um, maybe a few months or so older than the slave master's daughter who was like, you know, a little bit socially delayed, developmentally delayed that they kind of paired them up and made her a playmate or rather a companion of sorts to the slave master's daughter. And so with that, the intention was that by virtue, the hope was that by virtue of them roughly being about the same age with Josephine, progressing socially at the normal pace that by virtue of her being a companion to the slave master's daughter that she might then quick up that she might then pick up on things a bit more quickly which is what ends up happening and over the course of the story the two of them become good friends there's this theme that runs throughout the book about motherhood women motherhood and childbirth not so much the physical experience of it but the pressure placed on women to become pregnant to have babies things of this nature the experience of that the stress and strain on women especially it's especially apparent during josephine's time the pressure placed on women the expectations placed on women to have children and the stress that can result the social issues that can result as when they're unable to or when they have difficulty either becoming pregnant or carrying pregnancies to full term. You know, I don't want to fully give the story away, but it's like a scene really that courses throughout the book to me, this thing about motherhood and childbirth. It gives you insight into these practices and experiences at different points in time. As you see a version of this during Josephine's childhood, which is like the 1850s, and you see it later on in her life um, with her being a doula in like the 1920s. And it's like, despite the years that have gone by and Josephine pretty much being at the beginning versus the end or closer to the end of her life, is surprisingly how little things change. Whereas with Josephine, when she's a child, the slave master's wife struggles to become pregnant and to carry children to term. And so at that time, there was an expectation and a lot of pressure put on women to have multiple children. With her difficulties, she feels like there's some social strain. And as a result of like the social structure and whatnot, kind of this thing, the saying of her people hurt people, where with her feeling judged, for lack of a better term, or looked down upon for her difficulties in in um, having multiple children or difficulties in her attempts to have multiple children, that it then affects the manner in which she interacts with enslaved people in her plantation. When things are going wrong in other areas of our life, when things are going wrong in like this personal area of our life, then it might result in her lashing out at the people who are enslaved on her plantation. And it's actually really unfortunate. Later on in the 1920s, when Josephine is now an older woman with adult children of her own, there are two women around her who have pregnancies taking place. One of which, you know, actually kind of launches um, around the time that her son is getting married. Her son had a child from a previous relationship, but unfortunately, with the way that things worked out, you know, her grandson's mother is not around anymore. He's now met this other woman. They get married. And initially, there's a bit of tension there because as with Ava, where Josephine and her family are more self-made, her son's new, her son's wife's family have had a different experience where they've been free for a longer amount of time. As a result of that, they have like more professionals in the family. Like her son's mother-in-law, I believe is a teacher. And I can't remember the jobs that other people in the family do, but they have professions. Meanwhile, Josephine feels like they might judge or look down upon her because of the reality of her having been born enslaved. It's an openly known thing. And so everything that Josephine has, or Josephine and her husband and their family have acquired, it's been a result of them working hard. They don't have professional jobs. It's like pretty much they've worked hard and acquired money that then enabled them to purchase land on their own. And so with that, they now have this property, which 
I think given the time is an amazing accomplishment, not to judge anyone or anything like that, but it's like, I've read in other books where people express either themselves feeling shame at, at having been enslaved or their ancestors being enslaved. And it's something that I've never really understood. But then again, I guess it's like, as with most other things, when people are victims of a crime or they've had some crime committed against them, you know, when trying to explain how this can happen to you or you find yourself in these circumstances and situations, it's something beyond your control, not of your doing. You might feel embarrassed about it or ashamed about it when really the shame should fall to the person that committed this wrong against you. And so when the book picks up in the 1920s, Josephine has kind of ended her career as a doula. She no longer like delivers babies and she doesn't really practice anymore as a medicine woman. But when her son's wife becomes pregnant, she steps in to fulfill that role. But at the same time where, you know, she's at this point where it's like her son's an adult. He has a family of his own. He has his own house. They manage this farm together. So, you know, Josephine has her home and some neighbors move in, a young white couple, a husband and wife. It starts out with them maybe, you know, waving hello, giving each other a nod or whatever. But in time, the woman kind of goes out of her way to come over and visit Josephine as a means of trying to befriend her. And she starts out bringing like little baked goods, jams and things like that. Josephine's known as a pretty good cook. So a lot of the stuff that she brings, Josephine can actually make and do quite better. And so initially there's some tension because keep in mind that this is the 1920s where they're living. Racism is still very much a thing or hostile racism is still a thing. And so it initially brings some distress in Josephine's part because it's like, why is this woman coming over? You know, it seems to be a breach of social norms of the time. And so it gives Josephine pause as she tries to figure out like, you know, what this woman's angle is, where it's like the expectations might've changed. You're not necessarily expected to have six or seven kids, but there's still an expectation for a woman to become pregnant and have children, right? With her now having difficulties becoming pregnant and remaining pregnant, you know, um, she finds out that Josephine used to be a doula and a medicine woman and believes or hopes that in coming to Josephine and speaking to her, that she might be able to become pregnant and to carry the child at full term. And so she takes the opportunity to try to befriend Josephine. What ends up happening is they form friendship of sorts. But the unfortunate thing is that Josephine comes to find out that this woman is actually being abused by her husband, which, you know, I completely understand the situation where often in situations like this, there are social dynamics at play that Sometimes people don't feel comfortable, realistically speaking. The best thing for you to do in a situation like that where you're being abused, whether you're a man or a woman, is for you to leave that relationship. But knowing that it can be dangerous and there can be other factors complicating things, most people generally don't feel comfortable commenting on these situations, or at least not directly, especially if it's not someone that they know very well. And so especially here because of the racial dynamics, Josephine is apprehensive to offer any advice or at least to do so directly. It becomes this thing where the neighbor woman is pregnant. She becomes pregnant. And her husband is physically violent towards her. It could just be the stress of living under these circumstances, but she ends up losing the baby. And with them forming this friendship, you know, the woman is kind of as Josephine comes to understand, like she comes from a fairly poor background. Like her family didn't have a lot of money. Her mom doesn't really care for this man that she's married. And there's like this little note that's made about like his shoes, which I thought was a really interesting way of expressing the progression of someone's life, where at the time that this woman married her husband, her mother commented on him having very nice shoes, like very fancy shoes, which is something that stands out to her because being poor, she probably doesn't have nice shoes herself. And so at the time that they met and he then married her daughter, who, she, you know, 
His shoes were very nice, but by the time Josephine comes across them, ends up living next to them, it's like she looks at the shoes and realizes that they've seen better days. So it's like the wife explains that he's here in the area trying to start up a farm and is just not having success at it. His crops are not producing as he would hope, you know, not excusing it, but she believes that some of these failures can be a source of his frustration. He has these ambitions for himself in the farm that he's trying to establish. And here it is that he's having difficulties, you know, progressing, you know, they don't fully dive into the details of things, but the way that farmers function is that they use credit. They'll take out credit to buy seeds and whatever other resources they need to like plant their crops, borrowing against estimated future earnings. So it's like if you take out loans in hopes of the crops producing enough for you to pay them back and like those crops fill or you have livestock and let's say the livestock dies, number one, you're not going to make a profit. But then beyond that, you have extra problems because you now also have this money to pay back and the resources, the products that you were hoping to have generate revenue to repay these loans you haven't made that money, right? You're, you're in the negative. And so not only did you not earn a profit where the end result would be zero, but because you borrowed money for this stuff, you're in a deficit. You can find yourself in some serious difficulties, right? As this man's plan for farming just isn't working out. And so he's taking out some of those frustrations on his wife. And so with that, she's seeking out Josephine, hoping that maybe if she can become pregnant, if she can carry a baby to full term and have a child, that maybe with that happiness in the house, it will be like a positive thing within his life that allows him to maybe let up off of her. The book is actually pretty interesting in that while it jumps back and forth between the lives of these two women who live at during different time periods, they share much in common. They're both marginalized within their individual time periods, Ava as a biracial woman and Josephine as a formerly enslaved woman. But at the center of their stories are their relationships with other women, right? And as part of that, with these two women in particular being marginalized, the primary stories that feature are their relationships with women who are both disadvantaged but also privileged. As in the case of Josephine's neighbor, sure, you have her neighbor living next door who is being abused by her husband, having difficulty conceiving and carrying children to term. But as the story progresses, we actually see that she does exist in a position of privilege at the same time as drama with her husband and Josephine's family um, ends up showing that while they might be poor, they might be struggling, they might be having difficulties, giving the, the racial components of the time, they also have ad advantages, you know, which allow them to really wreak havoc on the lives of Josephine and her family, which is kind of unfortunate because you bear witness to Josephine kind of having an inkling that things could go very wrong with this relationship, kind of getting a bad feeling about things, but yet still trying to be nice to this woman only for it to, to some degree, come back to bite her. And then you have Ava, on the other hand, who tries to do a good thing for her grandmother by moving in, hoping that they could build a better relationship, uh, a more a stronger bond and whatnot, um, and her trying to make things better for her and her son, only to find that, like, on the one hand, while her grandmother, in her own way, loves her and did love her when she was a child, that this disease that she has... It puts her at a disadvantage in the sense of that um, she loses track of time, she gets confused and things like that, and it makes her act out in ways that she probably wouldn't if she had her full capabilities. But at the same time, it offers a peek into who she was in the past, and it plays back into this thing of advantages and disadvantages, where it's like, sure, she might be disadvantaged dealing with this um illness, but at the same time, she's very well aware of her advantage in that by merely screaming, you know, that um, things have been stolen or that they've committed some kind of wrong or crime against her or something like that, that other people will come rushing to her rescue. And so it's quite interesting to read the book and to see while despite these different time periods, the, the complexity of these various relationships between women. 
And so it's like the story is actually pretty interesting. It wasn't like overly long or anything like that. There were a few points where, you know, it's kind of, mm, you know, this seems a little bit convenient. But um, overall, I, I thought the book was pretty interesting. It was, for me, a, a rather quick read and um, a book that I think you could enjoy. I think it'd be a good book to discuss as a group. Like, it's certainly fine to read on your own, but to discuss as a group, there's like different things going on here um, that I think could be interesting to analyze and discuss where, you know, you and other people have read the same book, but you kind of discuss to see how your perspectives differ. Thanks for tuning in. Show notes are available on the Noir Histoire website by the link in the episode description. If you enjoyed this episode and want more book recommendations, subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, and check out my book review playlist.